Uh, so we're going to do some lightning talks, uh, and then we're going to play Jeopardy and Pictionary, uh, mostly SQL Server-ish focused or adjacent. Um, the lightning talks, we decided to put a twist on it. Um, so we each prepared four lightning talks, but you're only going to hear from one each. Um, our lightning talks uh, focus around these things. Uh, I wrote a slide deck for Bert. Oh boy. Uh, yeah, you should. And I haven't, be I haven't seen it. Yeah, he's not seen it. it. We have no idea. We have yeah. no idea. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, some slides with some random timing uh, where the person speaking isn't going to have buttons um, to to advance their slides. Uh, there's going to be uh, one where we all have the buttons, so we can all control the person's slide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, by the way, I need your clicker. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> hey, what's your mouth? Oh, Sorry. 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 We're on, we're on prime yeah. time. Yeah. Jeez. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have, I don't have a clicker. I don't have a clicker. You don't have a clicker? I have a clicker. All right. Well, uh, then I guess you never get to advance any slides. Shame on me, Yep. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, we each have a slide deck that is about something that's not SQL Server related, in case uh, in case y'all are interested. So uh, we've got a lot going on. So we're going to jump right into it. Um, <laughs> okay. So listen. <laughs> Talking to the microphone. If if you go to Google and you type in my name, that is the picture that comes. Up. <laughs> I am I am not a master of SEO. Please don't ruin this for me. <laughs> when people search for me, that's what I want to see. So I, I, that's that's CrossFit. If you I, ever wonder. I showed the slide and uh, Bert was like, "Oh, come on, Andy." I was like, "I swear to God, I searched for your name and took the first photo of you." And he didn't believe me, so he went and checked, and sure enough. Uh, so, uh, first, I think uh, were we going to draw names? Were we, I forget. Were, are we just going to let people pick who they want no, to hear talk first? I thought you had something uh, to pick. Yeah, I, I, was, I, was, I was going to, and then um, I spent too much time uh, on, your other slide? on some of the other slides, yeah. So, which one of us is going to go first? Yeah, Bert. I think saying? that's a crowd choice. Yeah, who, who do you want to hear from first? Bert. 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 All right. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah. uh, should we? Should we? Oh. Should we pick? Uh, <laughs> what, should we, yeah? what, what do you guys want to hear Bert talk about? SQL injection. SQL injection. Oh, no. All right, SQL injection. All right. I'm actually really relieved because that's not the deck that Andy made. So. <laughs> By the way, he doesn't know what's going to happen with the deck. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so is this, this? Are you guys driving this deck? Yeah. Yeah, we're driving this one. All right. Here we go. I'll uh, I'll try to do five minutes. So SQL injection. Ten. Ten. Go. All right. Oh, wait. Are we supposed to be over by those chairs? I, I think I think you guys should sit down. We're we're all green. Sorry. All right. Go ahead. Don't well, well, uh, so SQL injection is all about how to prevent unwanted data and executions from happening to your SQL queries. It's the actual number one uh, vulnerability risk in SQL Server uh, as defined by OWASP. So I have to keep watching my slides because I'm really afraid when this is going to change. Um, basically, in order for SQL injection to work, if we're only looking at SQL Server, like, so we're not dealing with application code, is you have to have an execution of a dynamic SQL statement. So, oh, yes, thank you. Here is our dynamic <laughs> SQL statement. You can see we're, we're putting, <laughs> there's our select. <laughs> we, and we have a parameter being passed into this string that we're building, right? So obviously this is a simple example. Hopefully you wouldn't use dynamic SQL to generate this query, but uh, we're passing a parameter display name and then we are executing the whole statement. Wow, perfect timing. Oh. All right, perfect timing. Um, so let's take a look at an example of SQL injection. Um, so if we pass in a value to our display name field, <laughs> Let's say we pass in my name, Bert Wagner, right? Nothing funny about that besides the name itself. And uh, if we advance, thank you, then we get, you know, uh, that gets compiled to just display name equals Bert Wagner. So when that string gets so built together, that's what happens. Now, on the, uh, on the flip side, if we decide to pass in some other creative piece of SQL statement, like 4, 1 equals 1, who knows what the 1 equal 1 will return. Like, what does it evaluate as in SQL? True. True. So it's going to return all of our rows, right? So if we execute this statement, the, uh, the actual statement that gets compiled looks like this. Display name equals blank, or 
1 equals 1, right? Which is going to just do a dump of our entire table uh, because there really is no predicate there. It evaluates to true. So how can we fix this? <laughs> uh, well, one way is to uh, use a function like SQL. Uh, which will completely protect your uh, SQL from injection attacks as long as you are using it correctly. So here we have display name passed in as a, <laughs> as, a, as a parameter directly in our query text, and then we are uh, parameterizing it in our parameter definition. We use SQL. ooh, fancy. Um, then it will execute, it'll be safe. Any malicious text will, will not uh, execute as the hacker wants it to. So we're totally safe. Um, so if we go ahead and look at some example queries that run in here, we pass in Burt Wagner, we get Burt Wagner, nothing nothing uh, too suspicious there besides the, the person himself. Um, here, if we pass in our injectable query text, we get nothing, right? It just, it's actually going to error out in this case. Um, and it's fine, or it'll, sorry, it'll get evaluated as looking for or one equals one as the display name in our field. So as long as there's no users with that username, we'll be good. All right, finally, what we don't want to do is roll our own uh, security functions, right? So Why not? Mm -hmm. Well, Andy, <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> um, so obviously using SQL is the right way to go. You can't always use it for every single scenario, which is tough. Um, we're not going to get to it in today's five minute session about alternatives, but you definitely don't want to write your own code. So here's an example, right? We're going back to creating our, uh, our dynamic SQL statement, and we are writing our own replace function at the top. We're replacing any single quotes with two sets of single quotes, which should escape any uh, injection attempts. So we think our code is safe in theory. Can you talk into the microphone? We're having trouble hearing. I, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. We spent uh, all of like 80 cents. <laughs> <laughs> These are high text, text Drew. <laughs> um, so if we go ahead and actually execute this, so let's see how our function works, right? So if we go ahead and execute this, thank you. Uh, <laughs> one more time. Thank you. Right. Once again, with my normal use case, everything, uh, you know, the, the query that gets generated is perfectly fine. However, if we now pass in our injectable query, you can see, once again, the OR1 equals 1 is just passed in as a string. Everything is okay, too. So yay for us, our injection replace function works, right? It's not guaranteed. So the one thing I didn't point out is if we go to the next example still, thank you. Here we pass in this value, and I know especially if you're in the back of the room, it may be a little difficult to see, but we've replaced one of these single quotes <laughs> with an apostrophe, um, which, unfortunately, our replace function didn't catch. And why does this happen? So we actually have an implicit conversion problem here. The one thing I did point out, or maybe I do on the next slide, we'll see, maybe, yes. Uh, and one more time, please. Oh, yes, look at that. Display name is a nvar card, so it's a Unicode data type. However, our query variable is just a var card data type, so it's not Unicode. So when the implicit conversion happens, where we are typing in our display name uh, here, the implicit conversion happens converting our nvar card data type to a var card. And so SQL Server doesn't know what to do with that curved apostrophe character. And so what it does do is converts it to a single quote after we ran our homemade security function. So if we ran that and it executed, uh, the hacker can still get in. So that is it. Thank you. I think I'm the only one who knows how the entire slide deck works. <laughs> Was there any follow-up questions? I, I had a question. The homemade security would also break like Kellen Potvin Gorman or anyone who had like a yeah, once you get the people's names that have apostrophes in them and stuff, yeah, like O'Malley, right? You're yeah. going to have a lot of, you know, Irish people who are very upset that they can't, you know, purchase your product or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, so who, who's next? Who do you guys want to hear from next? Her. <laughs> <laughs> her, 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 her. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do you want to hear about? 
All right, so if you do not know, I absolutely love dessert. And the killer thing right now is that I started. Oh, not funny, Eugene. I started Whole 30 on Monday. Maybe you know what Whole 30 is? Do you love Buckeyes? Those are great desserts. No. <laughs> so Whole 30 is 30 days of no sugar, no carbs, no dairy. Stop cussing. No, <laughs> no alcohol, no nothing. So all the things I'm about to talk about, I cannot have, right? Doubly painful. I'm sorry. It's okay. I can, I can take it. So first of all, what you need to know is that I, loving all types of sweets, right? Um, one of my favorites is probably cookies. So these are homemade chocolate chip cookies. And I know that the Nestle Toll House, Nestle Toll House, did any of you ever watch Friends? Friends. Get that, thank you. Okay, so I know that a lot of you um, probably use that recipe, but there's a really good recipe by this woman named Joanna Gaines. Okay, you guys watch uh, Fixer Upper? So Google Joanna Gaines cookie recipe. This is what these are pictures of. Uh, it uses two cups of brown sugar, it doesn't use any white sugar, it's very good. But here's the thing that you need to try when you make cookies at home. You need to have a cookie with some cookie dough oh. on it, right? <laughs> I would recommend it. So you take the cookie right out of the oven, right, and don't let them cool, because that ruins it. <laughs> right out of the oven, you put some cookie dough on that, and you eat that. Okay, You'll, you can thank me later. Question, Aaron? Yes. Are you a, a butter or a shortening? Uh, oh, I'm a butter, but Grandma used... Lard. Well, well, I, I have a question about the rotten eggs in the in the. Rocky did dough. it. He's fine. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm just gonna say that the, the FDA requires that you mention that eating raw or undercooked egg products is not a health risk. Commercial it's break. We're back. <laughs> All right. So next dessert. This dessert is from London. So if you ever go to London, you want to go to a restaurant called The Pig and Butcher. I don't even remember the address, just Google Pig and Butcher in London, and you'll, you can go there and you can get this dessert, which is like a, the, the, when it's got the gooey center, right? You know, like a lava cake or whatever. And then, I think those were hazelnuts on the top? Yeah, they were hazelnuts. And then we had some vanilla ice cream on the side. So this was my birthday dessert this past year. Um, it was extremely delicious, but in addition at the Pig and Butcher, should you ever go, they have an appetizer of, it's an appetizer, right? Is that what yeah. that is? Yeah, the, the Yeah, so yeah. it's bread and beef drippings. Ooh. It's just a pot of beef drippings, and it's delicious with the bread. Okay. It's vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did I, did I, did I do what? My glass is empty? Uh, well, yes. If it's dessert, we'd have it. We've had a few yeah. by dessert. Okay. Oh, Whoa. Whoa. Okay. This is in Chicago. So in Chicago downtown, there's a bakery called Magnolia Bakery. Now, the thing is, is I needed a fork next to, this, next to this to give you some perspective. Because that piece of cake is easily like two of these. Now, it's mm -hmm. mammoth. Uh, and this is just a nice vanilla cake with a chocolate frosting. I highly recommend that. They, um, they also have muffins or whatever, but just go for the cake. Like, they have these big, huge pieces. Now, if you follow me on Twitter, <laughs> you know that I like donuts as well. And there's this donut shop in Cleveland called Brew Nuts. So if you're ever in Cleveland, you need to go to Brew Nuts. It's on Gordon Square, which is 65th in Detroit. And they have themes all the time. So a couple weeks ago, it was a cookie theme for donuts, so this is the Cookie Monster donut, right? Which is just a nice um, yeast donut. It's got a chocolate glaze underneath with the sprinkles, and then half of the Chips Ahoy cookie, because you know those are classic from your chocolate. And if you use coupon code Aaron, since they know me so They do know me. Um, <laughs> thankfully, it's like 20 miles from my house, so it's not convenient. And then, um, do you put them all in here? <laughs> I, I, there are, Two cookies, I have cakes, two oh, okay. donuts. I'm in a rapture. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, when you go. I'm diabetic. Exactly. <laughs> Get over there. Right. Understand, it's a killer for me because I can't have dessert tonight. So. It's a killer for him, too. Yes. yes. <laughs> All right. So, so he can eat. <laughs> uh, too soon. Um, so these are cupcakes. 
cupcakes from Sprinkles. Sprinkles is out in California. So this, this was in San Diego. This is after we'd gone to In-N-Out Burger, which I highly also recommend. No. So with Sprinkles, I'm ignoring you. For Sprinkles here, um, there were four of us, and we got a six pack and we shared. Mine was this one over here. This is marshmallow in the center, vanilla with the marshmallow, or sorry, chocolate with the marshmallow. Um, these two were peanut butter. This was the Sprinkles sprinkle, right? So it's vanilla with a white frosting and then sprinkles on it. And this, does anybody want to guess what's on top here? That looks like strawberry quick. No. Pop rocks. No. Beets. No. <laughs> Marmalade. No. It's a, it it's a, it's a crush of um, ch Cheetos. Not just oh, Cheetos. Flaming hot. Flaming hot Cheetos. So this is a cupcake with flaming hot Cheetos on the top. Um, it actually worked. I just had a small bite. Um, yeah, my husband ordered it. What's that? Nope. That, that I don't I don't know what you're talking about. All right. Then we have my homemade caramels. So I make the homemade caramels in exchange for things that people bring me from other countries. So when my friends come from the UK, they might bring something. When my friends come from Australia, right? If they bring treats from their country, I make caramels at home. This is my grandma's recipe. Um, she has written it on an index card. She wrote it down like a few years before she died. I asked all of my grandparents and my aunts and uncles to write down like their recipes. So I have their handwriting and the recipe, highly recommended. Um, so her homemade caramels, which are in no way good for you or healthy, but they are absolutely delicious. I make them at Christmas and when I need to exchange for things like, hang on, all of this stuff. So this is me and Jess when we're in the UK and we went to the grocery store. You can see we're in the Cambia. Uh, I probably had a good five pounds of candy when we came back. Um, not this just was, for me. This was uh, minutes before we went and made that cake. Minutes before the cake, right. So we were stocking up. So um, I don't know if you can see in here. Here we go. This right here, this is my very favorite dessert. Thank you. Right in the middle there. Yeah. It's a curly whirly. So it's caramel ribbon with chocolate on top of it. If you ever have the chance to try one when you're in the UK, I highly recommend it. Um, the Kit Kats are pretty good as well. The Crunchies, I'm not such a huge fan of. Um, Curly Whirlies, absolutely. So there you go. Questions? <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Who's next? You are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you. What am I talking about? Short cuts, short cuts, short cuts. All are smooth. All are smooth. No, short cuts. Short cuts. I know what's in it. Short cuts. 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 Oh damn. What's what's special about the short cuts? Drew made I these slides. <laughs> I did it. It's me. Uh, so I, I, I'm actually the only person that got to see the slides someone else wrote for them because I'm the one that compiled the slide deck. So I know it's in these. Uh, so that's pretty awesome. They're really good shortcuts. Yeah. Uh, so these are good. <laughs> This is a one slide lightning talk, so I'm going to take you through it. So, uh, the, the anarchist guide to, to shortcuts, uh, when I first saw the slides, so first of all, Drew sent me these, and uh, I accidentally deleted this from the slide deck when I saved it somehow, so I messaged him yesterday and was like, dude, you still owe me slides. And uh, he's like, no, they're there. And I looked at it, and I thought it said the architect's guide to shortcuts, and I thought that was awesome, because I'm a database architect. And then I looked closer. Um, so uh, this is uh, an ideal thing for you to do. Uh, open up a uh, command prompt. Um, right click to run as administrator. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's, you can right click on most applications, run as an administrator. And then you want to type take own slash f c windows sys32. Uh, and what that does is that makes sure that you own it. Uh, if you're a Linux admin, it's like uh, 777. 777 is permission heaven because 
you have permission to do everything. This also works in Windows Server. Also, yeah, also works in Windows Server. So, so this is a good thing to do on your production server if you want to get fired. <laughs> you can schedule all the downtime you need. Yeah, <laughs> if you're having trouble getting a downtime window from your uh, employers, you can do this and it's guaranteed downtime window. <laughs> so, yeah. So then uh, Dell FQS, so that's uh, force, uh, quiet. force quiet, so you don't get any of those pesky should I continue. <laughs> uh, and S is recursive, right? Yep. Yeah, so uh, everything inside uh, C Windows System 32 gets a Dell applied to it. Uh, yeah, dude, you're getting a Dell. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then uh, step four, you get to probably take the rest of the year, week, month off, who knows? Uh, plenty of time to update your LinkedIn profile. Um, and then at, uh, second option, as your computer boots, uh, F2, F8, or F10 to get into the BIOS screen. I never remember what it is, I have to mash like, I do the, the, the keyboard thing all the way across the F keys, hoping that you get the right one. Uh, go into your BIOS settings and disable secure boot because nothing could possibly go wrong uh, if you disable secure boot. I'm sure your InfoSec team at work would love love you for that. You don't need BitLocker. Yeah, yeah. But like, what has BitLocker ever done for you? <laughs> really, guys. What what has BitLocker done for you? For me, I, I all it's ever done is uh, when I try to take a machine uh, drive out of a machine and put it into, into a different one. It just makes it hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's all I have for... Do you have anything else? That's, that's, that's all true. Do another one. Do another one. Yeah. Do another one. Do another, do another, do another, another light and talk? Wait, can yeah. I tell you my favorite shortcut? Sure. There's two, actually. Control shift U when you have a word highlighted. Do you know what that does, anybody? Uppercase. It uppercases it. Because all your keywords should always be uppercase. <laughs> I can help with that. Fight me. <laughs> yeah, talk to, talk yeah, to Grant. He can help with that. He's got tools. All right. Yes, uh, that, that was a short one, so I'll, I've got time to do another one. Oh, wait, I have a question relevant to the presentation. Sure. For me? So if I do that to myself, what should I do to me as my employer? Uh, <laughs> as, as a self-employed person, uh, yeah, you, you should probably just close a job. <laughs> <laughs> just end it all the best way I can. <laughs> the next phrase to learn is, would you like fries with that? <laughs> <laughs> Smooth. That, that, that's Smooth. Smooth? Okay. Smooth. Uh, which is good, because I took this, I sometimes do this before uh, sessions when I'm at lunchtime as people are coming back, and I took it out today, so no one's seen it. Uh, who knows who Oliver Smoot is? I know Grant does. He's from Boston. Uh, so, Grant, sit on your hands for a minute. Uh, Oliver Smoot was MIT class of 1962. Uh, he went on to be the uh, now former chairman of uh, ANSI and the former uh, president of ISO. Uh, you probably recognize these standards committees like ANSI standard sequel. Uh, obviously, that is why I'm talking about Oliver Smoot today, right? Nope. Not a chance. <laughs> uh, Oliver Smoot was a fraternity pledge for uh, Lambda Chi Alpha at MIT in uh, the late 50s. Uh, when he was pledging for Lambda Chi Alpha, uh, they had the pledges lined up there, and uh, Oliver Smoot was the smallest one, he's five foot seven, and they said, you guys, we want to know how long the Harvard Bridge is, the bridge that links uh, Cambridge to Boston, uh, right next to the MIT campus, we want to know how long it is, and we want you to measure it in Smoots. So they took <laughs> Oliver out, they put him end over end to measure the length of the bridge, and they had to prove that they'd measured the bridge in smoots. So they took a bucket of paint and they painted lines and marked how many smoots it was going across the bridge. To this day, uh, the bridge is marked. The bridge is 364.4 smoots plus one year. The bridge, the pledges for Lambda Chi Alpha uh, go out every year. They have to do the same pledge. They have to repaint the lines on the bridge. To, so that when you go out there, there's all of the markings of the smoot going across, smoots going across the bridge between, uh, between Boston and Cambridge. It is literally an ANSI unit of measurement. Uh, when he was leaving ANSI, uh, they gave that to him as a kind of gift to ensure that a smoot remained uh, indoctrinated. And you can indeed look this up uh, in the American Heritage Dictionary on your phone right now. 
I'm not BSing you, this is really a thing. When they redesigned the bridge, uh, since the 50s they've rebuilt this bridge. When they rebuilt the bridge, they built the bridge so that the sections are exactly five foot seven. That is not a standard size for bridge segments. Uh, this is uh, Oliver reenacting, uh, doing a demo of uh, the Smoots. Uh, he was back on campus for uh, the MIT's anniversary of moving to their current campus location. Yes, sir? Is the Smoot Imperial or Metro? <laughs> uh, it's ANSI. I assume that makes it uh, Imperial. Yeah. Yeah. American. Uh, yeah, it's 100% it's per American. Uh, so, uh, and I do this talk before sessions. And the reason I do this talk before sessions, so I've got extra time with like a longer session or like when people are gathering after lunch. Um, and usually people start asking, like I get to this point and I can see the eyes glazing over because they're like, I'm here for database compression. <laughs> and I say, Andy, why the, are you telling this story? Because what does this have to do with anything? Uh, and uh, Oliver Smoot said this, and I think that this is a profound statement. Things that you pay no attention to at the time can have big consequences. It applies to your personal life. It applies to when you're uh, pledging and become well-known for uh, being a unit of measure rather than the chairman of ANSI. Uh, it also applies to database design. Like, think about what you're doing before you throw that thing together and uh, make a crummy database. Uh, and that's my slide. Yay! Yeah, I got it too. We've got 30 minutes. Do you want to skip me and go to Pictionary? Uh, no. Oh. Uh, no. Oh. no. <laughs> Drew, 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 you're up next. Drew, Drew. Uh, board games. Board games! 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 I need, I need, I need a judge's ruling on this because I can't tell. Containers. 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 All right. Just tap, tap the containers on the screen. Containers. Just touch it. Four. Touch it. You did it. All right. So containers. Uh, who can't hear you? Give me my phone. Yes. Please speak into the mic. All right. So, so I'm sure by now you have heard about our new container overlay. Yes? Yes. Okay. yes. Alright, so everybody's familiar with containerized architectures, containerized database, containerized applications? Yes. Hope so. Okay, so here are some containers. Okay. <laughs> um, these are some of my favorite containers. Alright, uh, first of all, um, if you're shipping things overseas, we've got a standard kind of shipping container here. These get loaded one on top of each other and bolted down. Really good for moving things across oceans or across trucks. Um, or building a cheap house. Or building a cheap house, building data centers in them. Um, I've, I've heard tell of people building skiffs in them too, uh, burying them underground for doomsday scenarios. Really, your imagination can run wild. Um, if you're a fan of confectionery, um, this, these guys here will um, uh, store all sorts of things for uh, all of your baking needs, um, any type of other cooking necessities. Uh, the one up top there, I can't really tell what's going on with that one. I can't tell if it's glass or plastic. I'm hoping it's glass because they're better. Um, yeah, so you can put all sorts of things in containers. Oh, hold on. Oh, shoot. Okay. So in all seriousness, though, right, one thing people talk about when they talk about containers is it's really easy to say, hey, Drew, is a container like a VM? Well, not really. I don't know what's funny about this slide. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> I didn't do it. So, one thing that trips people up, right, is that if you are familiar with virtualized architecture, it's easy to think about containers as being just like a virtual machine, and that's not entirely true, right? Containers usually live on top of your operating system. There is some little kernel or some little thing that interfaces with the operating system. It doesn't have its own operating system. Each container doesn't necessarily have to have its own independent installed operating system, which is one of the benefits. So if you did want to spin up a containerized version of SQL Server or Nginx or some other application you want to run locally, you don't have to worry about, where's my Windows ISO CD? Do I need to install Ubuntu? Do I need to join this to a domain? You can't do that yet. And all these other things that are coming, that may or may not be coming. And um, they're really, really good for quickly spinning up dev versions of your databases, of your applications or anything. Now, I gotta tell you, I was reluctant to get into the container game. 
just because I didn't know what all the fuss was about at first. I didn't. I didn't, and just like I didn't understand what all the fuss was about VMware when it first came out. I didn't know. I was just some dumb VBA that didn't do database backups. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. In my last job, I had a chance to take this from this is cool to run on my desktop to this is cool to run in production. Now, I didn't do database. Okay? One of my last acts at IGS before I left there was we were playing with energy monitoring and we were playing with IoT hooks. Okay? And we had a chance to do some containerized Azure Kubernetes service stuff to keep stuff running real time, never going down, issuing new versions of software, zero down. Having a declarative infrastructure that you issue a command to say, upgrade this container from this version to the other, with no downtime, right? These rolling updates, these declarative things, it is really eye-opening. If you haven't had a chance to play with just, I'm not even talking about getting started with Kubernetes because that can be pretty mind-bending. If you haven't had a chance to start up an application, play with it, and then run an upgrade to see how that works, you owe it to yourself to try. It will change your perspective on how infrastructure and software deployments will work. It is worth your time and effort, believe you me, it is. So, other containers, right? If you're in to noodles, noodles usually come in these little white containers. I think you can get them pretty much in bulk. Um, I gotta be honest, the last couple times I've ordered Chinese food, they don't have the wire in them anymore. Anybody else see this? I feel gypped. Because you have to pick them up with your hand like an animal. What the fuck? Um, uh, more containers, more things stacked on top of each other. There's probably some really cool or legal stuff in those. <laughs> uh, if I, if I, I've watched a lot of The Wire, so I know what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, so that's all I got about containers. You owe to yourself a try.